It's 4 o'clock on a Monday, and you know what that means. It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Yeah. This week, inspiring special guest star, Mr. John Fulford. Woo! <laughs> and welcome back, John. Thank you. Good Thank to you. Have glad, you here. glad to be here. Thank you, Cheesy Fake Band. I appreciate your efforts more than you know. <laughs> Thank you, my iCarly audience. Um, let's go down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this way. Yeah, so we, I'm telling you. Yeah, if any of you guys out there know of a, a webcam, I've actually looked a lot. Not just a good camera. Cameras are easy to find. A camera that's got uh, the interface that lets it be a webcam, it's got a wider angle lens. I am so down for one of those. We need one. Anyway, um, John's been on the show before. I love having him here. He's very smart, very articulate, very experienced, and he comes from a composer background and then realized he had more requests for music than he could fill with his own little fingers. So he started a library, and I would say, I'm guessing the majority of the people in your library are from Taxi, or at mm-hmm. least a big chunk uh, of them. Yeah, a big chunk, if not a majority. And, and he's done very well for them, and uh, he comes to the road rally, and he is beloved at the road rally for hanging out, educating people, and he's met a lot of composers at the rally. So anyway, I asked him to come here today because I got an email the other day from not John, but another music library owner, mm. and uh, he wrote to me, and I won't disclose who he is, I'm, I'm I think I crossed this stuff out or took it out of the email. Hi, Michael. Um, Just here working and have downloaded two folders of songs from one of my new composers, quite possibly one of your members. These folders are simply labeled February 2015. Actually, Feb 2015. Now I have to go back and figure out who this guy is and relabel his folders for him so I know who they came from. Second mistake this person... Oh, another thing that this gentleman who owns the library pointed out. Another favorite is to label the folders with nothing more than the name of my company, meaning ABC Library or XYZ Library. Um, I don't want to get the folks at ABC upset. Uh, Great for them on their end, big hassle for me. Another favorite trick is to send me 10 you send it links instead of just compressing the entire folder and sending me one link. and then I'll get this other, he calls it a tactic later, but I wanted you on the show. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the, this is going to be a good show today. I'm going to tell you that much right now. Yeah. So uh, you and I talk about this stuff. We had dinner, I don't know, three, four weeks sure. ago. Um, it's not that we have a bitch fest, but John's in the trenches and he's a really hard working guy. This is one of those guys that if he's awake, he's working. Mm-hmm. So... Let's talk about poorly labeling music files, which causes the industry pro to dislike you because you've, they've made it hard for you to work with them. Elaborate, please. Sure. What do you have to go through? Well, thanks everyone for sending music, first of all. Um, And I, many of the things we're talking about that people are doing quote unquote wrong, I've done everything wrong you could think of. It's just, (laughs) I, it's just, I was dealing with music supervisors that instead of never working with me again, they gave me some tips. You know, really? so it's like very... I just didn't come out to LA and know all this stuff. So, but it wasn't like every supervisor because I don't want them to think that they can then just blindly submit to supervisors and that they're going to get a bunch of tips from. No, the no, 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 not not at all. And I'm very thankful and lucky, and uh, you know that that they that they gave me. Now, when I say they gave me tips, it might have been like half a sentence. Right. They wouldn't. They didn't sit down with me and tell me how to like label next, my stuff. Hey, dude, know? next time relabel or label your file. Like yeah. This. Yeah. So. Yeah, I mean, what, just should I just talk them through like a general way? To- well, let's talk about specifically labeling the music files. Yeah, we, um, I think we talked the last time we were together about how people pick the poor titles, but this mm. is actual files. People label it from their perspective. What does that okay. make you have to do as a library owner? Great point. When I, when I log into my Dropbox.com, which is why I don't like to use it, there's hundreds of folders called Fulford. Mm-hmm. Fulford Music. Audio for Fulford. That's cool if I'm only getting audio from one person in my entire career. But (laughs) if I'm getting audio from literally hundreds of people, you know, and some of them are soups. Yeah. Some of them are coordinators. Some of them are composers. Some of them are first com sending me stuff, you know, that they want me to take a look at. So it's always good to be as specific as possible with your submissions. The way I do it is 
I, I write Fulford underscore the date and what the music is for. So it might be nice. Fulford, February 15th, Urban. Right. You know, so, and there's only so much you could write in, one, in a folder name because you don't want it to be like all huge. Yeah, and if it is too long, by the time uh, it, it gets shortened down to the it's actual. Like F-U-L dot dot dot. Right. Yeah, and that's that's just as bad. So just at least write your, your name and the date and if you can, what it what it's for. I would think you've always got to have the genre in there or the show. Yeah, the show. You know, yeah. and a lot of times, the like let the listing or the supervisor or the taxi screener kind of you get the info from them, and that'll help you dictate what to write on your folder. I get stuff you internally know? from from my staff here. Um, I will ask them to do a little research on something, and they will send me an attachment that says. Um, for Michael, same same deal. Sure. It's like, what is it for Michael? Yeah. So you really got to think about the person on the receiving end. So then, I, I would contend that you, as a library owner, um, and that supervisors alike, uh, you know, you let out a little, and, and you're thinking, yeah, and, and maybe you say something because yeah. you're kind, and you give them that little half sentence tip, yeah. and they do it again. You probably don't want to ever work with them again. Yeah, because right? there'll be another guy coming in. Like I'm gonna give a shout out to Dean Crepain. Love him. Yep. As the first time I ever worked with him, he sent me some music, and I didn't tell him this. So if someone wants to tell him, the metadata, the everything was 100 percent perfect yeah. without me having to say anything. He's and he, a, and he a does. Pro. Yeah, you know what he? Everyone knows what kind of music he does. So next time I need that kind of music. I'm calling him first. Yeah. Because he just know he had the key, the BPM, everything I will possibly need when I upload those songs into Source Audio because I'm doing a deal with Source Audio now. Yeah. All the info he he already put in a Word document for me. So, just be cognizant of what the requester is, would need. Put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. You know, if it's say it's for Michael, you know, it would like, put like. The name of the employee and form of uh, PDFs for Michael, the but date or what whatever kind of it is. PDFs? What kind so of PDF? Marketing yeah. plan. Road rally panelist. Version three. Yeah, in exactly. The, in the date, because a lot of times, as well, and this happens to me too. I have to keep cognizant of it. You know, when I'm doing cues for these big money libraries, there might be three or four different versions before they accept one. Mm -hmm. So it has to be remixes, first com version one, version two, version three. Oh, they might. They might want version two again, so I gotta resend them version two. So you gotta keep everything meticulous, and I'm not, I'm not the most meticulous person myself. I'm more creative, so I really gotta spend a lot of time doing this stuff. And the first person I hire on a full time basis isn't gonna be someone to help me with music. It's gonna be someone to help me with all the stuff we're talking about, because it's that important. It's you know? the engine. The people who get ahead in this industry are the people who don't need their hands held, that make the creative people at the top look good. Yeah, and. I understand everybody wants to be creative, but the business stuff is what supports it. It's the foundation. No, definitely. So it's important, and, it, and it's not – I know it seems easy, but as we all know, like this email, it's, it's important, and it's kind of detail-oriented, which is difficult for a lot of musicians. Yeah. And I'll be the first person to raise my hand. So if I tell someone that their metadata is off or their stuff needs to be relabeled, I've made that mistake more than they'll, more than they'll ever dream of making it, <laughs> you know, yeah, all you have to do is go into uh, hit the info button or info tab in iTunes, and um, you know your first name, your last name, your phone number, your email address, the genre of the music, um, BPM, the mood. If you had just that stuff, people would really appreciate. It. That would be enough to work with, right? Yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, and up until a month ago, I didn't even need the BPM, but at least if it's there, I could just delete it if I want. Yeah, but if it's not there and I need it, then that's then that's a hundred times more work than highlighting something and just deleting it off of the iTunes metadata. Uh, I remember last time you were here, uh, I encouraged people not to reach out to you because now you know his name, and, and I'm assuming the same thing is true now because John had to go home and re-tag two thousand tracks or pieces of music for a particular library that wanted his stuff, but they only wanted the data in a certain... Yeah, what was that for? I don't remember, but you had to do 2,000 of them by hand. Yeah, I did, didn't I? Yeah. 
And I've got to believe, you know, look, most libraries are one, two, or three-person operations other yeah. than the big ones like APM or First Time that might have a staff of, you know, 25 or 50 or 100 people. Sure. Many, many libraries are just one, two, or three people. So for him to have to go in and retag 2,000 pieces. Yeah. And, and and the funny thing is that that's, I just remember the deal it was. They had a new team come in to handle the uh, metadata, like the ingestion, and they need to retag again. But... That's okay because I'm going to hire someone to do it, you know. And and the and the the success I'll get from that is far outweighs the money I pay someone well, to do yeah, it. Yeah, but you got to have somebody who's meticulous. Yeah. So now someone I'm meticulous, detail oriented person. Yep. Um, okay. Uh, number two on the five mistakes that can kill your music pitches are sending too many files instead of compiling them into one compressed file containing all of them. Um, you would think everybody would know that. But sure, that usually happens a lot with Hightail or you send it. Yeah, you end up getting 10 you send it files mm -hmm. instead of a zip file with all of your 10 files in it, and that, that that's a bad one. I mean, I'll take it a step further. Some people attach two files to five emails to get to 10 tracks. That's strike three. That's do not pass go, go directly to jail. Right, and there's no excuse for that. I don't care how creative you are, you know, <laughs> but um. With you send it, just make sure you're not sending all your songs in one different email. Each. 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 Right. Make make sure it's all or don't send ten links in one email. And you, you know, I still gotta yeah. click it ten times. And you wanna make sure going back to number one, not only should you take all ten songs or twenty five or whatever amount you're going to compress into that one high tail file or whatever service you're using make sure that you label that folder that they're going into oh, super well yeah. because they're going to download it's going to go on their desktop and it's going to get lost in the sauce yep. if they can't remember fulford urban yep because a lot of times if you have a folder called fulford urban and there's 10 files in the folder and you zip those files mm -hmm. it doesn't take the name of the folder it just says archive right so you right. got to go back and rename it right you know and luckily when i made that mistake i was sending music to a friend of mine so she was like, "What? Is, I can't keep track of that. Oh, good. You know, because I would send stuff to her quick and not think about it. But when I sent something to supervisors, then I would send it a different way, a more meticulous way. Okay, so you tell know? them how you would send it. How I would send it, even in you send it, you don't send file by file, even if it's in the same email. To where like, when you go on Hightail, which is you send it, it's another name. It's a new it. name. Bad name, yeah. by the way. You, you log in, never say add file if it's more than one file because even though you're sending the files as a series i still got to download each i, I still got to click for each song the download button so they'll all be contained or attached to one email that that the recipient is going to get from hightail but still gonna yeah be it's 10 still songs. it's not 10 emails like people used to do now yeah. it's one email 10 clicks just make a zip file on your desktop of the songs and then send that as a file or if you have the hightail desktop app you could click send folder and send an unzip folder and Hightail will zip it for you. Mm -hmm. If in doubt, send something to yourself first. Great idea. A lot of times when I send stuff to soups, like every Tuesday I do my soup, uh, my sync mail out with all the big DJs and acts I work with. And every Tuesday there's a new release for sync. Mm -hmm. And every time before it goes out, I send it to myself to look over. But one time I didn't do it, there was a, there's a typo. Yeah. So you got to do it. Send it. When in doubt, send something to yourself first, and look how smooth and clean it is to download. If you got to click more than twice or something, something's funky, that's okay. Regroup. Take ten minutes. Figure out how to do it in a better way. If it takes upgrading to a Hightail Pro account for twenty bucks a month, that 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 it's, you know you know it's what I mean. Nothing. Like, it's yeah. the cost of doing business is twenty dollars a month. Um. Yeah, we hear that about taxi. Oh my gosh, three hundred dollars a year. Well, if you amortize that, it's twenty five dollars a month. Yeah, and, and you would spend that on one dinner out, one relatively inexpensive dinner. Sure. Out. And, and uh, yeah, cost of doing business. All right, um, number three on the list of five mistakes that can kill your music pitches: not sending what the publisher has asked for. Um, this would apply, of course, to supervisors as well. But trying to fit a square peg into a round hole by pitching the industry person, no matter which type that person is, what they don't need. How popular is that going to make you? I've made, I'm looking at all these mistakes. I've made every one of these mistakes dozens of times. 
And we didn't even talk about no, these We didn't even talk about these mistakes. I mean, I made them all like a, a while ago, but so I know both sides of the story. Yeah, so even though you've got the greatest song in the world, if it, and, and you're trying to rationalize in your head, oh, I think they're going to dig this anyway. Mm -hmm. Is that going to score you any points, That's or is that going to make them hate your guess? an advanced tactic. Yeah? I, I do that sometimes, <laughs> but you got to know when to do it. Okay. And when to not. If you're dealing with a supervisor, you got to know when to do it. If you're dealing with a publisher or a library, don't, don't do it. Okay. You know, because they're under the gun from the soup looking for something specific you know. right now. Um, the best thing to do for that stuff, because I know like you, you might have five urban comedy tracks that a library or supervisor wants, but you might have 205 uh, country tracks mm -hmm. that you really want to get out there. Just send the stuff they're looking for. And if the stuff they're looking for is that great and they use it and they like it, they're going to ask you, what else do you have? Right. And then you could pitch them everything, but you got to let them come to you you like if you're a car salesman i don't think the car salesman is gonna gonna start rattling off the top of the line model of all the luxury options they're gonna say oh why don't we get you in this car and then they, they like the car then they go well we could also get the leather seats right the heated seats this and that rust proof warranty they don't try to sell everything at once because it just scares or even away. sell you if you come in there looking for you know a, a sporty little two-door and all they've got is a minivan and they're trying to convince you that the mini Van is perfect for you. You're you're going to be out of there. Yeah, totally. so I hear this a lot from supervisors that reach out to big publishers, the big, 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 big publishers that have uh, long worked with record labels and have pitched music for artists to cut on the record labels, and then they tried to transition into film and TV. I mean, you can think of yes, it used to be back in the day. We're talking 15, 20 years ago. You would see most songs in a major feature film would be Warner Special Projects. Mm -hmm. um, PJ Bloom back in the day with Marine Crow. Yeah. They had yeah. a pretty good uh, soundtrack department. Absolutely. And, and those people that pitched from the publisher side of the record industry to film still to this day will just pitch songs that they think are hits. Mm hmm rather than really paying attention to what the supervisor has asked for. And I think that the supervisors have really started to like smaller libraries and working with independent musicians because they're more likely to get what they really need. I hear this complaint from supervisors a lot. I am loath to reach out to the big publishers because they just send me what they think sounds like yeah. they, they don't understand what works with pictures. And, you know, and I, every Tuesday I send out a sync mail out to everybody with the big, my big songs. Yeah. But if someone asks me for specific music, I only get them that. Whether and if I don't have it, I don't, I don't have it. And they'll appreciate you letting them know that you don't have it. Yeah, and a lot Th of times. Thanks for hitting me up. Sorry, I don't have. It. Yeah, yeah, totally. And then, and then they might hit me back. Well, I also need this, mm -hmm. and it's something I have a bunch of. Right. You know. Um, also, with with the mail outs, I do. It's an interesting point. That eighty five percent of the downloads of my sync mail out come within the first day. That means 15% of my downloads come one, two, three, maybe even four weeks after I send it. Mm -hmm. So they, so the supervisor doesn't need that kind of music right now, but then they put it off to the side. And when they do, they download it. And a lot of placements come from those three, four weeks later when they download it because they need it at that point. They're this, not just downloading just to download it. You this know? brings up something that's not on my list, but I want you guys to hear it from the horse's mouth. Our members get so frustrated when we forward them Let's say somebody is a first-year taxi member, and the first couple months they don't get any forwards. Then, you know, towards the middle of their first year, they're starting to get some forwards. They incorporated some feedback. They're starting to find their, their groove, and they're getting forwards to be it a library or be it a supervisor, what have you. And then it's time to renew at the end of their first year, but they don't renew because they haven't got any callbacks from a supervisor or a library. Sure. Um and then two years later, we hear from that person. Oh, yeah, you know, by the way, remember I got a couple forwards during my first year with you guys? I eventually got uh, a song in this big feature film because the supervisor called me. So tell them about how things sit on a virtual or real shelf and get used in their own good time. Yeah, that's why it's a catalog. You know, that's why it's a library. Some track of some books in a library, they don't get read for 50, 60 years mm -hmm. until that one person working on their thesis needs that biology of skunks or something and then that <laughs> you know what i'm saying and then that that <laughs> love that book becomes uh becomes available so i mean i have songs most of my placements for my big money sinks they don't come till a couple of years after it's either like two weeks 
which means I made it custom or like I had a brief or something that I did yeah. or, or like two years later, you know, which, which is, uh, you know, which, which is a lot of times par for the course. Now my first comp stuff and my extreme stuff, that's different because they, they have a whole team of people and a whole bunch of briefs coming in worldwide. Mm-hmm. So I'll get like a French film a few months after, you, you know what I'm saying? But like all else being equal, generally speaking, a lot of times it takes years, year, years and years, but that's good because of, you know, you get one sink after two years, and then it might sink again a year later, then it might sink again a year later, boom, boom, and then that's how you build up a pipeline. But yeah, well, you're making a strong case for feeding the beast and building yeah, you that pipeline. Feed it. Uh, and, and that's why these people that don't renew after getting frustrated in their first year, not that I'm here, yeah, okay, sure, I'd love to sell some taxi memberships, but um, they get frustrated and ticked off, and they walk away from it thinking, ah, taxi doesn't work. Actually, it does work. It just takes time. Yeah. And if they'd been feeding the beast and filling the pipeline for that year or two or three before they came back, mm. they'd be so much further down sure. the road, and their income would actually start being cumulative and better. Yeah. But people, I understand the frustration, but you don't know unless you've been around the game and, and know that. So that's what we're here for. Yeah, yeah, no, de- definitely. You know, the, I have a sync on deck right now that might come through, and I wrote that song about a year and a half ago. And a sync I had uh, late last year, I wrote the song in 2012, so it was two and a half years. Yeah. Later. And the soup had it. I I sent it to him two and a half years ago, and it sat there for two and a half years on a hard drive until a scene came where they needed where they needed it, and then they popped it in, and it. it it beat out every other cue from every other publisher and library. It wasn't like... Some that had been sitting there as long as years, some that came in the day before. Yeah. And you probably labeled the track well where it hinted, at least gave them some direction as to what it was so that when they went back and searched their entire hard drive for anything that was reggaeton... Yeah, where like it was like a Skrillex style, like bro, bro step, dubstep kind of yeah. killbot style is track with a rap vocal. So whatever folder they had to... to accommodate that type of music it was in there but with hundreds of other tracks yeah and they could have easily called um well if they called extreme it would have been my track or first kind of the, they would have called another library that i don't have a bunch of dubstep uh, tracks with called apm yeah i don't yeah i don't have any tracks in apm yet so if they called apm and they got a whole they could have got 200 dubstep cues mm-hmm. they probably did but my cue beat beat it out but that's because I was doing cues for years and years and years and years and years, feeding the pipeline and getting better with each with each cue. You know, that's what the pipeline's for. It increases your talent as well. It's not just to land sinks. Right. You know, so the you the more get you do, better. the better you get. Because a lot of these libraries, when they when they pay for you for an album, like these big money PMA libraries, it's good money. But you need to do all these little sync cues that maybe don't even get used ever to learn the process and how to work on deadlines and stuff so that when a big money library calls, you will get fired, you know, and they'll hire you again. Yeah. That's why big money libraries don't hire everyone. They need music every day. These libraries have hundreds of thousands of songs. Every kind of genre that pops up, they need it, Mm -hmm. you know, to stay relevant. So the reason that they don't hire every single composer that comes across their path is not because the music's not good. Well, the music might not be good. But even if the music's good, you gotta convince them that you know how to work to a deadline and that you've done done songs like that for years and years before. You know, uh, this is kind of tied into that. Uh, number four on the list of things that can kill your music pitches is not knowing the lingo or the lexicon of the business, not knowing what a stinger or button ending mm. is, not knowing what an exclusive deal is versus a non-exclusive, and it's not just knowing the terms, but it's knowing what the terms mean. Um, we had somebody the other day, a taxi member that passed on a deal. Admittedly, the person who owns the library uh, is not good about returning emails, but it's tough, as you know. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. For every it's minute tough. you're returning emails or phone calls, you're not pitching. Yeah. Um, so this guy has a bit of a reputation for being you know, less than uh, good about getting back to people, but... He's also had a gazillion placements and is distributed globally by a larger library with a great reputation. Okay. So you want to be in his catalog. Yeah, yeah. And uh, one of our members passed on being in in the guy's catalog, um, lived outside of California, if I remember correctly. I spoke to the member on the phone. Very nice guy, certainly intelligent. And he did the right thing, kind of, in that... He felt a little squeamish because the contract uh, for the song, the deal was in perpetuity. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
he took it to an attorney who is an intellectual property attorney okay. mostly that does do some music stuff, but I believe in the state of Ohio, not sure. exactly a music mecca. So the music attorney goes, I would never do this deal. They want 100% of your publishing. Well, in the world of records and publishers, yeah, usually it's a co-pub deal where they the publisher gets half the publishing, the writer keeps half the publisher's share and keeps the writer's share. In mm. the library world, it's extremely typical that the library would get 100% of the publisher's share. So even though this guy was smart to reach out to an attorney and get an opinion, the attorney just didn't know yeah. this part of the industry, didn't know the lingo, didn't know the norms. So how long did it take? How important is it for them to know stuff beyond the creative side? And how long did it take you to learn this stuff? I'm learning every day still. Every time I think i got to figure it out, I don't. But I'll say this, this is important. With your publishing, mm -hmm. I signed all my publishing away to Extreme Music for the albums I did. But I'm still entitled to half of the revenue from the tracks. So just because you signed your publishing away, you got to look at how much money you're entitled to. Publishing is ownership. So you're, so you're talking about making half the revenue from... The, the sinks. And then I get my writer's share. Okay, so when he says sinks, he means from the sync fee. So if a song gets used, uh, you know, in a primetime drama and they get 2500 bucks, he gets half of that, yeah. half of the, the upfront money, and then he gets half of the money generated over time because of his writer's share and the performance Yeah, role. but I don't own the track. Like, if I were to play it on right. here, we'd have to get a, technically we'd have to get a license. Right. So in, in the production music realm, and maybe even in the pop realm, publish, which a lot, I mean, you'll probably know, but a lot of cats don't know. Yeah. Publishing is just a, kind of a word for ownership mm -hmm. and the permission to replicate the track and to sign off on the track. You know, but always consult the lawyer, but that's what it is. So if you see you're signing away 100% of your publishing, right under it, there should be a clause that says, but the writer is still entitled to 100% of the so called, it's not, they always say so called, 100% yeah. of the so called writer share performance royalties. Right under that. A lot of times. Yeah. So even deals I look at, looking at, I just, I was just uh, started working with this new uh, big money library a couple weeks ago. It read like a ghost writing deal at first. Yeah. But then at the very end, it said, you know, writer still gets 100 percent of this and do 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 do. So you kind of have to look over the deal yourself and use some common sense and get an attorney that's in California that's probably worked with the library. Which is, I, I only know two or three attorneys that I've ever met that know the library industry. Well, yeah. Even if you meet attorneys that know film and TV music, chances are they've done it for a big publisher like Warner Special Products yeah. or something. And it's a different world when you're licensing a Michael Jackson song than licensing a John Fulford sure. song. Sure. Um, all right, so... Oh, you know, yeah. want to give a couple more tips on the lingo right quick? Please do. You can okay. give a lot more tips. Here's a couple of things that y'all should know. All media, world perp, excluding theatrical. All media means every type of media. An app, TV screen, uh, phone, uh, anything. A iPad, Netflix, Amazon. That's all media. And probably stuff we haven't even thought of. Yeah, and they do that on purpose. Yeah. A lot of stuff we haven't thought of. Or that Apple hasn't thought of. Yeah. So you notice at the end of the sentence, it says, excluding theatrical. That means they can't show it in the theater. So 99% of the licenses for TV shows are like that. So it's all media. World means everyone in the world. A lot of people say universe now because there might be a colony somewhere. Yeah. You know, we, we don't know. We didn't know about no DVDs 30 years ago, you know? They could play it with astronauts walking on the moon as their wake-up music, and they yeah. would actually need a license yeah. to broadcast that. So it's all media, world, or universe. Perp means perpetuity. Forever. It, that license doesn't expire. Okay? But you don't want to say perpetuity to a soup. You want to say perp. Okay. That's just the way they say it. So <laughs> Because they're like perpetrators. They got to do the yeah, perp Yeah, they got to the perp walk. walk. <laughs> all the way to the mailbox. Um, so they might say, all right, I got, all right, I got a placement. It's $10,000 all in, all media, world perp, excluding theatrical. And I'll say, all right, I can sign both sides. So what both sides means is that I can sign off on the publishing and the master. On my big money DJs I work with, a lot of times I can only sign on behalf of the master. Sometimes I can only sign on a piece of the publishing. Because Ray, they've sampled other artists. Or they might co-write with a guy on Warner Chapel or, you know, or co-write with a guy that wants to sign his own, mm -hmm. you know. But, but some artists, ones that I built up a lot of trust with and experience over the years, I could sign on both sides. 
you know, so the artist could be in Austria on tour on a, on a bus somewhere asleep, and I could be like, okay, that's mm-hmm. good. I could sign on both sides. So both sides means the label side and the publishing side. But the music libraries, like the paperwork they give you, you sign over both your master, which is label rights, and uh, synchronization rights, which is the publishing rights. So APM doesn't have to go to anybody to clear a track. They approve it themselves. You know, so just know what that means. Or like if a if a soup goes, all right, we got uh, five thousand dollars all in. Generally, that means that's twenty five hundred for the master, twenty five hundred for the publishing. But if it's a cover, if it's five thousand all in, you might get five hundred bucks for your version of a, a massive attack song. Because massive attack, since since they're a bigger artist than you, you covering them kind of does you a favor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, a lot of people don't understand what it means 100% ownership or control. Sure. Um, and I think it scares away a lot of taxi members, not just taxi, but in general, people that co-write. They think they can't submit something they, they've co-written or, or you know produced with somebody else. Um they don't understand. All they need is the ability to represent that without getting their yeah, it's control. Slant. Yeah, yeah, totally. Like, I control a lot of things I have co-writers on that I don't have to ask them to sync it, but I, I still owe them their fifty percent. And what kind of document do you have to get with them? Uh, it can't be done in a handshake because you could end up. Yeah, in a lawsuit. That's, that's not. That's never good. It, usually, it's just a split sheet. If I have, like, if I wrote it with somebody, mm-hmm. if it's something that I uh, like that I didn't write, and I'm just representing it mm-hmm. if they're giving me rights to sign off on stuff then it's a big document mm-hmm. how um, big maybe like 12 pages okay you know um if it's with a big money dj who has layers of management and other things i'm, I'm not signing nothing mm-hmm. i'm not signing anything because their management's going to sign it and they might have their attorney who i might know to look it over and sign it. just they might add these little clauses that don't mean anything to us but they they mean stuff to the big lawyers yeah. You know, it's never killed the deal before. Just these little things here and then, these little doodad clauses. Yeah. Then I like I just need a one page thing that says I'm allowed to pitch their music. Yeah. Uh, so what about uh, you talked about a split sheet? Your I come over to your place tonight, and you and I are working on a hip hop track, sure. and it's fifty fifty. Are you going to present me with a split sheet right then and there and have me initial it uh, or sign I'll it? I'll usually wait till the song is done because we might get stuck on something and then bring in one of my people or one of your people to help finish it. Uh, do you ever run into a situation where you bring in that third guy and the third guy's a bit of a bonehead and says, dude, uh, I didn't know that you had Lasco working on it. I don't want to go three ways in this. I'm not signing anything. No, I usually tell them. I usually okay. tell the person up front. I've never had a problem with that because like, I just started working with this new writer and he was introduced to me by a music supervisor. But other than that, I haven't written with any like real new people in a while. Mm-hmm. He, you know what I mean? Well, no, I take it back. I've written with a couple of new people, some great people, but they all know what the deal is. Like they're already in the scene. But see, they're in the scene, so they know what the norm is. Yeah, they know what the norm is. Where I can imagine that somebody who's based in Ohio and is relatively inexperienced or utterly inexperienced, and they're going into a session with somebody maybe at your level who also happens to live in Ohio, and that person hits them when they're done with the song at the end of the day and says, hey, look at this guy. Wait, I'm going to address this right away. Until somebody's interested, signatures are superfluous. What right. if a supervisor calls me for a track? And wants to use it and needs a signature today. And the guy's and on the, the guy's plane. in jail on a plane. Yeah. Or he doesn't do music anymore. Yeah. And then I have to tell the soup that uh, man, this guy's. I don't know what that guy is, but that guy, that guy should be a comedian. And then I tell the soup, <laughs> I, I tell the soup that the track's not available. Guess what? You know him. He is kind of a comedian, but a smart one. I tell the soup, sorry, the track's not available. I have a click. Yeah. And I'm I'm donezo with that supervisor forever. Yeah, I mean, if I pitched it as a big DJ track, then that's fine, because that happens. But if it's one of mine, All right. you know, that's why they come to me. If not, they could go to 50 Cent or whoever else, rap, big rap star, to get a hard-to-clear track. They come to me because it's easy. It's you know I mean? amazing how many times we've reached out to our members because we've gotten a call from a supervisor or somebody. You know, we can't negotiate a deal or get involved in a deal. Sure. We can call up the member and say, hey, we just got a call from somebody in the music department at NBC Universal and they want to use your song XYZ. Oh, look at that guy. Okay, he was joking. My bad. <laughs> <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> he is a funny guy. Yeah. yeah. Um, 
<laughs> you would actually get along yeah, really well. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, so NBC Universal calls Taxi because they've tried twice to call this guy or email this person, uh, guy, gal, whatever, in, in the course of a day. And we reach out to the member trying to speed things up so that they don't, the member doesn't lose the opportunity. Sure. And we have gotten responses from people like a day and a half later saying, oh, I'm sorry, I, did, I don't know anybody in the 818 area code, so I didn't answer my phone because they live in Ohio. Not that I'm just picking on Ohio, okay? Could have been Indiana, Mojo. <laughs> it could have been Illinois. It could have been Montana. It doesn't matter. But we hear that from people. I didn't answer my phone because I saw an 818 number I didn't know. Dear God. 818, that's LA. I'd be like, hello? Yeah. Right. When I was in Florida, I, I would... I would <laughs> if yeah. I man, when you're living in Gainesville, Florida, you get a call from an eight one eight. Yeah, come on, then it makes the newspaper the next day. <laughs> um, okay, uh, let's see. Not knowing what broadcast. Oh no, I've got to go back to number five. Not understanding industry timelines. How slowly things. Oh, we talked about that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, an addendum to that: things do move very slowly. On rare occasions, they move very quickly. People always want stuff very quickly, but more often than not, the deal comes or the usage of the sink comes very slowly. Um, I know for some people, they want it so badly, they sit by the phone, they check their email incessantly. And, and uh, for instance, when stuff gets forwarded to a library and we tell them the name of the library, uh -huh. they, they will call that library, email that library. Have you listened to my stuff yet? Do you want me to send any more stuff? Um, Which I've done before. My, I've done that. It's not good to do, but I've, I've I'm empathizing with everybody. Like yeah, because sure. you're dying to know. I get it. Uh, you know, it, it's like finding out what the diagnosis is after they found a lump in your body yeah, or yeah. something. Uh, you want to know, but that's a turnoff, right? The best thing to do with that, yeah. It, yeah, it is. It is, because sometimes the person, the library might be waiting on a daisy chain of one or two other people to get back to them. Or it might not even be for a specific show or sync at this time. It could just be a general library adding yeah. to their catalog. Um, and you and I both know that they're libraries that are months behind in listening to the new stuff that's come into them. Sure. Filtered or not. Sure, sure. The best thing to do in this instance, I know it's easier said than done, but I've done this, so I'm, right. I can say it, is just put it out of your mind. I'm still waiting on a $100 studio musician fee from a guitar track I laid down in 1998. And they still haven't called me back. So, <laughs> Well, that one might be a no, little, that one little might extreme. Be. So, so <laughs> the best thing you could do in this instance is just to kind of put it out of your mind as best you can i know it's not easy to do grab one of those bumper stickers over there oh right it. submit write submit forget repeat is you just got to keep writing keep writing and make sure okay i'm this is what i would do in this instance if i want to hear back from a library they haven't hit me back yet i make say i send them five tracks or say five tracks got forwarded i make them five more tracks in the same genre that are twice as good as the tracks I already submitted, mm -hmm. and I send those. Ooh. I said, hey, let me know. I, I got some more for you, so at least you're getting them more stuff to check out. Yeah. Because I, I do that. I'm like, man, these guys need to write. I think they might have forgot about me. And I just don't want to say, I'm just checking in on this, because that's not, Ooh. you know. The checking in The word. checking in. But if I say, hey, here's some more. I know you're considering the original five I sent, but here's some more. Yeah. But you got to make sure those tracks are a lot better than the first. So each thing you send gets gets better and better and better so they can't not write you back. So in every meeting they have, like these internal production meetings, are like, damn, that Fulfer guy, he just sent some great stuff. Oh, I heard the stuff from a couple weeks ago. No, he sent me some new stuff. Yeah. Oh, we'll get him on the phone. You Think know? of it in terms of dating. Um, if you were to meet a young lady and you really liked her, you got introduced on a blind date, you went out to dinner, had a great time, if you start calling her, so, did things go as well as I thought they did? Uh, she might be a little uncomfortable. And then you call her again later in the day and ask her again. Pretty soon, she's going to be a little yeah. standoffish. Then again, if you lay back for a couple of weeks and say, uh, want to go hot air ballooning in Palm That's Springs this weekend. Gonna, yes, yeah, it, you just upgraded the, the yes. offer. Instead of saying, oh, did you have fun? Say, hey, you know, me and some friends, we're going surfing over here. You want to come too? Yeah. They, like, the same thing with these libraries. Oh, here's some more. Oh, here's some more. And then you might want to send a second follow-up email like months and months later. Hey, just if you need any more, man, I got I got you. Right. You know that. Don't look desperate. Don't bother them because again, they are spending their day pitching music. Even a supervisor, a supervisor has to pitch to the show's producer. 
Um, so everybody's busy pitching and their time is better spent pitching because that's where the money comes from, especially on the library side. Um, last thing they want to be doing is holding anybody's hand and making sure that you're chilled out. Sure. And if you, they do take the phone call and they don't think your music is what they need or is not good enough at this time, um, the last thing, you know, you're going to be so tempted to say, what can I do better? Yeah. They don't want to engage in that conversation. Even the nicest people won't engage in that conversation because it's too time consuming. Yeah. Because then if they engage it with that person, they got to talk to the other 100 people and then they're not getting their work done. Yeah. You know? It's a sad reality because everybody would love to get feedback and I understand that. Um, let's listen to some stuff. Let's listen to a taxi member track that was submitted today for the show. Letting this spin the whole time we've been on the air. Good thing I put fresh batteries in. And don't let me forget, we've got some Fulford music to listen to. And last week, I forgot to give away a copy of Steve Winogratsky's excellent book, Music Publishing, uh, The Complete Guide. Whoops. Damn. Um, so we're going to give one of these away. Sophia is going to remind me before the show is over, and uh, we will do our random thing and send some lucky viewer one of those so this is called keep on moving it's by two parts analog and let's have a listen and john will comment and uh, i will as well here we go keep on moving Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah. Good Seneca. 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 Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that was two parts analog. Song was "Keep On Moving." Uh, you want to lead off? Yeah. Um, the 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 intro sweep was a gladiator patch, or it sounds suspiciously the same as a gladiator patch. So I I don't like it when I could pick out the individual patches of stuff. So can they take a standard patch and doctor it up a little to make it yeah, less just, recognizable? Sure, sure. And that you know, it's just, that's just a weird quirk of mine. Um, also, the track was put together well. It's just like the notes that I don't know what, what kind of what if that was like a, just a minor key or what key that was, but it just made it really dark sounding, mm -hmm. which is good, but that severely hinders, you know, severely hinders your placement ability with the track. You know, um, I would have liked to hear. I like all all the synth swapped out. I mean, all the notes to the synth swapped out. The sounds were fine, but just something a little bit more palatable to a mainstream style audience. Like one guy mentioned UKF, for sure. Like UKF dubstep, dub 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 Johnny and all those guys is great, but I haven't heard too much of that stuff synced. You know, if 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 they made it to be an artist, then then that's that's great, hundred percent. But if they made it for sync purposes, I would just say to to make it a little bit more fun. And palatable, especially with a hook like "Keep on Moving," because that that's a great general "Keep on Moving" like that. That's a, that's great if the music was was more conducive to the right. They it's they're incongruous. "Keep on Moving" should be, uh, although uh, I did mention to John before the show about this incongruity factor, where the you know the music, the title, um, and the lyric should all line up so mm -hmm. that the supervisor, when they see the track name, they know kind of what to expect. If you saw Keep On Moving, you would think that it's going to be something forward movement. It could be for a car scene. It could be for a chase scene. It could sure. be for somebody doing something involving movement. Yet sure. this is very dirge-like and, and dark and ominous. And I finally figured it out as we were listening that Keep On Moving, it could be somebody's getting chased in a dark alley. Um, it might work for that, but the melodic progression just wasn't interesting enough. Sure. It, uh, the the sounds were kind of there and the production, and i got to compliment them. They had some nice starts and stops in there. It was easy to edit. They understand the concept of, of um, adding and subtracting instrumentation to mm -hmm. build layers of interest as it moved on, but it was, all came down to the melody yeah. and chord choice. And I'd trick out that drop, make it... Gotta get crazy with it. Pan stuff, stutter edit some things. Yep. Make it make it like really cool, you know. One thing you brought up uh, before the show. Rarely we don't. Uh, it's rare that we listen to stuff before the show. But I did play this one today, um, like thirty seconds of it for John, and he brought up one. You know, he said, "Yeah, you could use three or four seconds of that um, before you realize that it, it's dark and minor-ish." Uh, if you just had a quick cut and you just needed a tiny little drop of music, but if they needed something longer and listen to, to it in the context of more length, that they would move on to something. Yeah, it's like uh, we're saying like if an editor just needs a quick dubstep cue, maybe five or six seconds, and he was going home for the day and he didn't want to look deeper and he saw that, that would work fine. But it, I don't think it would. Um, I don't think it would hold up against like a. For ninety nine percent of the scenes that they need music for, hold up against like a cue face off between that and like another cue with a little bit more, a little bit more energy. And you could be dark and still have energy, you know. It doesn't have to be like look at this band Killbot on Dimmock Records. The singer is Jonathan Davis from Corn, and that's super dark, but it also has energy. And the stuff that there's less energy, it's not as dark. You know, it's a good, it's a good balance. You know. Um. Let's go opposite of dark, um, and we'll talk more. I'm going to listen to some stuff that you brought today sure. um, and have you talk about that. But I know that you're doing a, a, what you call a mega panel at Musicians Institute yeah. on Thursday, February 26th, right? Yeah, oh, uh, we'll talk about that right now? Uh, we can for a minute. Yeah. I'll, go, I'll go back and actually okay. plug it for you later. Sure. But this is in the context of dark and minor um, advertising music. Let's talk about that for a minute. Advertising music... 
95% of the time, maybe 98% of the time is uplifting. Mm -hmm. The opposite of this. Um, what are some of the things that you hope the audience walks away with from the panel that you're doing on Thursday the 26th, which is, is, is all music soups from advertising agency mm -hmm. type people, mm -hmm. right? They either produce music for ads or they choose music for yeah. ads. Okay, so um, what does most advertising music have in common? Most? Oh, geez. Although there are many types, you know. I would say it's extreme. It's either extremely uncreative, paint by number, hand clap, ukulele, ho, mm -hmm. you know, or it's extremely creative, making sounds out of dish pans. Dish pan, and, yeah, uh, about the yeah. dish pans and, and stuff like that. So with the conference, it's just gonna everyone, including me, is gonna get a good uh, is gonna get a good idea of like what's in these supervisors' heads when they go to decide what kind of music we need. You know what? Uh, what do they need for this spot? Is it going to be commissioned? Is it going to be synced? And then that kind of that kind of thing. You know, if it's it's going to be custom, then you know it has to fit a brief. If it's going to be synced like a license, they could just get totally uh, they could just get totally uh, ephemeral with it and kind of pick what they want and narrow it down. Uh, are Are you moderating? Did you figure that out? Yet? I don't know. I think I'm going to moderate. I might be needed like more like. Cause, cause we're doing all, it's like a whole day. Right. It's a whole day of stuff, and the panel is just oh, the only thing open to the public. So I might be behind the scenes coordinating other things, but I'm 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 betting that I'm gonna moderate it. Like I'm expecting to moderate it. And so it's not just for musicians institute people. These guys can go. Yeah. If they it's live for, in around LA. It is oh, gonna absolutely. be in Hollywood, right? Hollywood Music Panel dot com has a full set of panelists bios. Uh, it's thirty five dollars a person. Super cheap, like, and if you're a CSAC writer or a PMA member, there's a discount code. And that, maybe tax and, members and maybe, should get a discount. Yeah, I, I think they should get a discount <laughs> code. So it knocks it down to like 20 bucks, which it's is, you know. Cheap. Which is super cheap. And um, one of the, the biggest ads on the Super Bowl to, to a couple of weeks ago, we have the supervisor for the Big Coke ad. We just added him today. Cool. So it, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be great. Which what was the coke ad? The happiness spot with this band Hundred Waters from Gainesville, Florida. Um, it's my buddy Chip, who used to work at Crispin Porter Bogusky right in Santa Monica. Now he he's a freelance soup, and that was one of his first freelance gigs was souping the Super Bowl Coca Cola spot. What was the spot? It's um, like the they they uh, they put like a, a coin or something in the Coke machine, or no, they pour Coke in a computer server, and then all the internet hate. Bullying, uh, <laughs> it all turns to like love. Nice. And that was the happiness spot. Yeah. So, so all these soups, like every one of these soups, drop six figure sinks on people, like it's part of their normal day, which it is. So yeah. I think for thirty five bucks or twenty bucks to get access to not one, not two, but five of them, you know, one of these cats hasn't even been to L A yet. He's never been to L A, but he's souping for Microsoft. Yeah. So he's gonna be here. He doesn't have to rush off after the panel and go do work because he's not in his home state so it's going to be great none of these panelists have spoken on a panel in la ever and you know what they really love is after it's over follow them back to their hotel and take a manila envelope with the cd hey. and, and pay off the guy at the front right desk the hotel door. shove it under their door you know that's scary i've had that happen really? to me where i've had stuff slid under my door after doing a panel in a city and it's really um disconcerting to know that somebody in that hotel Sold out your room yep. number for a fiver, you know? Yep. Oh, the, the website is musicmegapanel.com. And guys, I have a deal with the W Hotel. It's at Starwood, like the West End. There's the rally. Because I'm buying a bunch of rooms for all the panelists. So if you need rooms, I could probably get you a discount. It, look, all five of these panelists could drop six-figure sinks on you and then forget about it an hour later because they do it so often. So if you have to get on a plane and fly into LAX... And go to this panel to meet five of these people, then fly back the next day, or stay here during the weekend. That that's more than worth it. You, you know what I mean? Like I think. Um, Sophia, go ahead and and uh, put the link. I see people are trying to put the link in, but the um, software on UStream is automatically censoring them. So Sophia, pop that in there because you're the moderator, and I think you can get away with that. Um, okay. Musicmegapanel.com. We'll, we'll pop it in. Yeah. There too. Uh, there's a delay, so I'm sure she's yeah, popping sure. it as we oh, speak. 
Um, okay, let's play some of your stuff. What are we going to hear first, and why are we going to hear it? This track first is a track, is an instrumental cue from Mr. Matt Vanderbo, just because uh, he sent me some stuff last night, like clockwork, like he does every Sunday. And this is a taxi member. It's a taxi member. Did you meet him through the road rally? Uh, or? I met him at Chuck Henry's house. Okay. I think in 20... I don't know, maybe 2014 or something. Okay, so Chuck is also a long-time taxi Chuck member. Chuck is also a long-time taxi member. All right. Uh, here we go. As soon as this fires up. this all right and that was from matt vanderbo uh who lives in idaho rhymes with vanderbo uh um, it does yeah and uh if i remember correctly he has like a uh, a shed that most people would park a riding mower in out in the back of his house and that's where he built his studio yeah and, and i interviewed him not long ago for um the taxi newsletter in his studio, he you know, said, is not that robust. Yeah. Many of these people have that in common. Sure. They know more about what's actually needed and how to make it than going out buying a bunch of gear, which does not magically automatically produce yep, this stuff. For sure. So what makes this valuable and workable and pitchable? It sounds nice and thick. It fit what I needed, you know, um, and God, Matt, we, everyone will be talking about Matt Vanderbo. He's coming up. I like it. I like it. The interview and then at the rally. Yeah. And the reason why is because his stuff's good. I could depend on him every Sunday to send me music. If he can't send me music, he gives me notice. Like, mm -hmm. yo, I can't send music for a few weeks, so I'm not sitting there waiting for something that's not coming. Because he does have a full-time gig as a teacher for nine months out of the yeah, year. Yeah, yeah. Full, totally yeah. full-time job. In summer, he goes totally crazy, makes a lot more music. Yeah, yeah for, for sure. And it just it fits the brief, and I feel comfortable giving these cues to, cause I, I just didn't make these cues up. Like I just didn't call them and say, "Can you make me these?" Just cause I wanted them. The people in Hollywood need them, so I feel comfortable sending these to, to my people in Hollywood. Yeah, that they're exactly what they need. They they meet or exceed the benchmark of what else is out there. And, and let's Q talk about the benchmark. First of all, what genre would you call it? That that is hip hop comedy or urban comedy. Okay, and benchmark for broadcast quality. I mean, that doesn't sound like you know a three hundred thousand dollar record but it sounds really good it's clean it's punchy where it needs to be sure. it's got uh it's well mixed or you know he's got it he's got it all right yeah is that a good definition yeah, of broadcast it, it, quality it, it, for this type of music sure everything's in tune the bass is nice and thick the highs are, are somewhat crisp there's there's little ear candies like the little DJ scratches and these little mm -hmm. things that you might not even hear the first time you listen to it, but you know they're there. Like y You feel it instead of hearing it, kind of. I'm going to play just a little bit more of it so you can point that out. Sure. Because in the taxi listings, you'll see us refer to um, musical and rhythmic hooks. Uh, it's not just a hook. Back, you know, back in my damn an old fart uh, in the 70s, a hook was the chorus. Give me a big, hooky chorus. A lot of little things add up to being hooks nowadays. <laughs> Thank you. 
to beep beep beep. Okay, so right there. Yeah. So that that edit point. Hello. Yeah, and, and then, then and cool. then how the how the sprinkles or the sprinkles the the wind chime instrument mm -hmm. how it went. Uh, 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 uh. So I know why that works. I don't know why like Matt. I hope Matt put that in there because it, he knows it works, or he might have put it in there because he did. Sounds good. I don't you know, think it was an accident. Yeah. His part, he studies the genre. Yeah. So instead of just going, taking an RMX loop of the wind chimes, he actually put the chimes in and cut it up so it sounds like it's produced. It's not just like dragging. It's not paint by number. You Let's know? listen one more time. So it's good for it's not it's not it's like it's do 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 stops and I do a lot of that with all my cues too for editors and you know they they dig it you know he can I, tell he put time into it and he, he knows that it's gonna pay off for him in the future and he just didn't throw it together to get a, a certain amount of cues to send them over you know and Matt being the smart guy he is probably saves many if not all those settings. And then we'll do another track when he's done with this one with a little different mood, a little different tempo. Sure. Uh, and crank out, you know, two or three of these potentially. If he had a full work day, a Saturday or sure. Sunday during uh, school season, he could do that. Um, you you know, have a guitar, put it over that beat with an instrument, you know, change, depending on your MIDI settings are, you could change a kick sound without having to go and change each individual kick like audio. Right. And it sounds totally different, but it didn't take you as long to do it. Yeah. You know? With that um, kind of music, there's no big edits. It's not like dubstep where you're chopping up sounds and panning, you know, like super busy kind of stuff. Like and, that's, and this isn't you know, just something that would get used only in a reality show. Um, did you see the movie Let's Be Cops? No. It was actually really cute. A couple of guys that uh, think they're going to a costume party, and I think it was a masquerade ball or something, whatever. They end up in, in, in police uniforms. And uh, so they decide, well, as long as we're dressed up, you know, let's go play the role. And they end up playing cops for a week or whatever. And this would have been great. Oh, totally, yeah. It would have worked in, that, uh, in a heartbeat. You know how that would work? I get hit up from a, a film supervisor looking for uh, urban comedy for Left Be Cops 2. And I'd send them that as an example. And they'd probably hire us to do some, like, some other music for that so they could get it exclusive. And, yeah. and, the, and the person who I will call for that is Matt Vanderbilt. Yeah, and they're like, oh, we love these tracks. I'm like, okay, cool. We'll get. That's how you get from making tracks for reality shows, and then a week later, you're making tracks for a big film. Yep. You know, like this. It's a great track. Excellent work, Matt. If you're watching, okay. What are we gonna hear next? Second track. Doctor Pedro, a cat I met at. Oh, I should have told me we we're doing this. Um, a cat I met at the road rally. I've had the worst time trying to find Spanish language. Writers. This this was a track I gave to someone in 2012 to write and record lyrics to, and they wrote lyrics to it, but they literally couldn't be bothered to record them for whatever for whatever reason. Um, so then I talked to this guy, uh, Dr. Pedro, at the Taxi Road Rally. Not Pedro Costa. Not Pedro. I don't think it's Pedro <laughs> Costa. Dude from Miami, so uh, Pedro Costa is not. He's from, Canadian. Oh, okay, <laughs> so I was at on my, on my panel, and I got done with the panel, and this guy ran up to me. And he's like, I could do, or, or no, he got on the mic. He's like, I could do urban. I'm your urban guy. I said, well, cool. And I sent him some music. He followed up with me twice. Ex not too much, not too, mm -hmm. he followed me just the right amount of time. And I sent him a track. And 36 hours later, I got this vocal. And it was just great. So now he's the only ur uh, Latin urban guy I'm using. So now whoever so calls So you me, sent him your track and he sang on it? Yeah, yeah. It's, okay. his, it's his, yeah, he wrote the lyrics in Spanish. And then my mixer here, and uh, the mixer guy, he's not even here, he's in Texas. He speaks Spanish, so then he lets me know what it's about. Like, So it's not about like something that won't get synced. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like the language, you know, with the yeah. words. Right. So now, this guy, Dr. Pedro, whenever I need a Latin urban track, this is my guy. So if First Com hits me up for more remixes, which they already have, and they need a Latin track, I'm hiring Dr. Pedro. If I, if I need to get more tracks just in my own library of Latin... I'll get Dr. So now, like, yeah. he's he's the only dude. Like, I'm calling him whenever, no matter if the budget is 100 bucks or for a vocal or 500 bucks. 
And if I need ten five hundred dollar vocals from Dr. Pedro, that's five thousand dollars. And plus if, sinks. If you needed oh. female vocals, he'd be the first guy you reach out to because he's going to know a female singer. Yeah, you know. The, yeah, that's my dude. No matter yeah. if the budget is just me paying him out of pocket for some stuff, I'll get synced in two years, like we were saying. Remember, like you wait two years to get synced. <laughs> yeah, but I think it's funnier that you just said that's my dude because uh-huh. I'm going to take that snippet. Uh-huh. <laughs> Not that I'm judging. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I, I get it. That's the dude. Bad you know? humor aside. Um, oh, there you go, Matt Vanderbilt, right? I guess I'm going to call him and say, Yeah. <laughs> you know somebody called yeah. Matt up and said, Hey, they just played your stuff on Taxi. All right. Hey, Matt, how you doing? Um, all right. So here we go. Uh, what's the name of this? Uh, uh, it's song? a working title. It's just called July. Okay. I wrote it in July of 2012. Okay, so there's a, a good example of how not to title anything yet. Yeah, I wouldn't say that as July. All right, I think it's called like Party and Fuego or something. Okay. <laughs> Tell him he's vocally fighting for his life, dude. Like he wants to land shit. You know, I can just tell. I don't know what he's saying about the end. How do you say John Fulford in Spanish? I don't know, he might be saying it right here. <laughs> At the very end, yo. Right here. Hey. I met Dr. Pedro. I saw a couple of you guys asking uh, if John Fulford runs listings with Taxi, and the answer is absolutely he does. And as you mentioned early in the show, if you guys would get here on time, that a big chunk, if not the majority, of the music in his catalog is from Taxi members, which we're very proud and happy yeah. about. Um, uh, through the stream, uh, it's very bass heavy, but that's no doubt due to sound issues. Yeah, it's crisp. It sounds crisp in the car. I checked. Um, Button ending. Mm -hmm. Does reggaeton get used or requested much? Not as much as as English lyrics, but when they need it, they need it. We actually get listings from people. Um, We've got one right now. A big music supervisor working on a big video game that they expect to, you know, it's from a top company. And it's going to be a big selling video game, they're predicting. Is it um, the supervisor at the game company? or is it like- uh, It's a freelance supervisor okay. that is working for the game company. Okay. And he's asking, it's, it's a game where they've got a radio in a car. 
Sure. So oh, it, I know. It, okay. Yeah, it's a driving game. Mm -hmm. and, and when you are behind the wheel, you can pick uh, which radio station. Sure. You're, and so he's looking for Latin stuff with vocals. Very few of our members have that or will submit it. Very few of them have really good stuff. And, and yeah, I'll, I'll give you the five bucks. That's, <laughs> okay. a, that's a taxi member. I'll give him the. I'll give uh, him the that is the, a taxi yeah, member. Hopefully screen, he'll he, screeners in here. Hopefully he will submit it. Um, it's amazing how many of our members don't read the listings thoroughly and miss these killer opportunities. And this guy's doing buyouts for. I could be wrong. I think I'm right. Thirty five hundred bucks. A pop. Okay, uh, On okay. some of the stuff we've run for this guy, it's seven thousand wow. dollars a buy up. Well, we'll get yeah. the, the doc the doc the good doctor to I'll email the good doctor tonight because yeah. that'd be a good Well win. hopefully we haven't hit the deadline yet, but yeah. Um do you guys often use African music? Um I, if, I don't know if you're asking John or if you're asking me from taxi, but I would say Think about it. How many shows do you see that take place in Africa? Travel shows on the Travel Channel yeah. might. Um, could be a CIA type show where somebody is going to exfiltrate somebody who's been kidnapped by Boko Haram or something, you know, in an episode that takes place in Africa. It's not something that you're going to get a ton of requests for, but some. And not many people will have it. Is that a fair Yeah, statement? I mean, if I was trying to make money off that, that stuff, I'd do 10 of the best dang African cues and I go to 8 p.m. Yeah. You know, because they'll pay you up front and, and they're more likely to get that African music request than, you know, smaller libraries, you know, because 8 p.m. has basically everything. Right. You know? Uh, okay, let's listen to one more. Uh, what do we have for the third track on here? Third track is uh, a co-write between this dude, Shane Eli, and myself. We co-wrote the beat and we co-wrote the lyrics. Okay. If I said it, I meant it, you already knew it. Unless you've done that, then don't tell me how I should do it. No such thing is impossible, cause when you feeling unstoppable, there ain't nothing. I was born in a lion's den like Rasta Mom, more fire than book, more fire buck. Got more hoes than a fire truck. Can't do no entourage, no chains on, ain't I'm a star. Just wanna win while I'm alive, mm. while I'm alive. Pray to God that his hands are tied. Walk the throne, better stand in line, but I hate. And if I make pay for that, I'm on board like a Samson Knight. Win it, win it, win it, win it. Until money running in my blood like more Buffett's children preach. If I said it, I meant it, you already knew it. Unless you've done, done it, then don't tell me how I should do it. No such thing is impossible. Cause when you feeling unstoppable, there ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. This guy right. Just gotta do it. Reaching for these stars, that makes me a lunatic. Flying to the astral plane, you know we out here doing it. You hoping that we losing, but we winning. There ain't nothing to it. Get up on the team or get ghosts. Poof. Keep it moving. Two tans with diamonds, staying up all night. How'd you get that? I'll tell you, I played my cards right. Oh, that's a six line. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we've ever had a guest sing on the show. If I said it, I meant it, you already know it. Oh, you can keep saying it. Oh, that's, it's, 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 it's over. I mean, my, my part's over, so I'm not excited. <laughs> no such thing is impossible. It's <laughs> when you feel an unstoppable there. Ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Ain't nothing to it. Nothing to it. Remarkably simple. Yeah. But effective. And then we get a little slow down the week. We get like, it slows down like that group the weekend. Yeah. Like, and two minutes in, just so you know where that piece, where the slowdown came. Somebody might just use that so and then use the build. Oh, yeah. Or use this. This is a whole different. It's all off. Such thing is impossible. When you guys are after the club, you drive home. That was very cool. And, and you know, 
it, it makes the point really well. Arrangement has so much to do uh -huh. with it. It almost mixes itself because all the parts are kind of in the clear. You know, mm -hmm. you don't have to look for them because they're there's not much to fight. Sure. Um, somebody I think has made you look asked the question or made the comment that many of the taxi listings will say don't submit stuff that sounds obviously MIDI driven. Mm -hmm. Now, for the most part, that means stuff like rock tracks or singer songwriter stuff. Uh, some genres are MIDI driven, obviously, um, and, and it's okay with dancey stuff um, or, you know, the beats in hip hop are going to be MIDI driven. Sure. But there's stiff, obviously cheesy MIDI driven, and there's stuff that doesn't sound that yeah. way. Yeah. How do you accomplish the doesn't sound that way aspect? Um, audition your sounds. Just because a violin is a violin doesn't mean it's going to sound good like a violin. Mm -hmm. You know, like, and I, I'm guilty of the same thing. Back when I first moved to L.A., I'd say, I need a violin sound and just click on the first one I saw, no matter how it sounded. And a lot of times it would sound not, not good, you know. It might be a great sample, but it's just being, it's straight yeah, it's, bow. It's got yeah. no articulation. Like, don't use no. staccato strings for a legato, or don't use a legato strings for a staccato piece. Right. For instance, like, really key and say, is this sound making, is this sound doing the trick for what it's supposed to do? And how did you learn those things? Trial and error. I got better sounds. Like like Omnisphere is so robust and powerful compared to some other synths. Like I don't, don't want to name. I don't want to make the designers mad at me. But um, some of those stuff just sounds super thin, and and that's okay. You use them for parts where you need something thin, but don't use a thin sound for something where you need a thick sound for. Mm -hmm. I think that's like that's like the surefire way to to alleviate a lot of that stuff, other than trial and error, which you know, it takes a lot of trial and error. But if you just be cognizant, if you need a big swooping string sound, don't go with the little dinky string sound. Use a little dinky string sound when you need a little string sound. Don't mm -hmm. use the big string sound, you know? Um, when you want the big string sound, uh, do you layer stuff from two or three different libraries? Might you... Uh... Sometimes. Sometimes I layer in a synth string from a different library. Mm -hmm. Just so it has an air of just like dimension. Yeah. You know? But I put it kind of in the background to where like you could hardly hear it. Right. It's more of know? a textual thing or a support than yeah. it is the actual sound. Uh, gosh, I heard something Friday, right before I left work. I heard a piece. The composition itself was A minus. Pretty darn respectable. Mm. Not amazing, but pretty darn good. Yeah. And the, pr the, the overall production, the mixing, everything about it was really strong. And it had one cheesy string sound in it and i thought to myself how could this guy not notice that yeah because he had everything else together so beyond me i didn't call him up and say dude why was there that one bad sound in there but you'd think he would catch it yeah and that and that cheesy string sound you said it might be great for another type of cue in another context yeah absolutely but just in not that the, context right because yeah. this was like a true orchestral piece more like a john williams kind of thing or yeah. a hans piece you know and, and um it just didn't work. It stuck out like a sore thumb, even though it wasn't that high up in the mix, and it, it wasn't like a solo violin playing the central melodic thing. It it was just part of the overall pad blend. Sure. But it was just so obvious. Anyway, oh dang. Yeah. Um, all right. So we let's see. I want to. Oh, want to give a book away. Let's give a book away. So we're giving away Steve Winogradsky's book, Music Publishing, The Complete Guide. Uh, for those of you who saw last week's show, Winogradsky, I love that guy. He is a first-rate attorney that actually understands the library business. He actually owns a catalog, but they just quit pitching the catalog. They found, he and his partner, Ron Sobel, found that uh, they're both attorneys, and they were, were spending more time and better quality time providing legal services and doing other music services. So they just quit pitching catalogs. So don't Google them and start sending a bunch of music because nobody's listening. They don't even have the guy on their staff anymore wow. who was listening to that music. And it's a great library. So now they'll just sell the catalog to one of the biggies and they'll go back to doing um, admin work and legal yep. services. Um, oh, Come on, do you really think uh, that we're going to, when somebody does me, that that's 
like catching flowers at the wedding. It's always, um, I won't even go there. But all right, I'm going to shut my eye. Oh, you do it. Um, you're the guest. Shut your eyes. Uh, I don't want to change the framing. Just shut your eyes, run your finger up and down there, right. pick a person and touch the screen. Uh, okay. Uh, yes. Mitch Mash One. Mitch Mash One. Yes. So, Sophia, if you would write that down and also... Damn, um, look at me going crazy. I know. Mitch Mash, if you would please kindly send an email to Sophia, S-O-F-F is in Frank Frank, I-A, Sophia at taxi.com. Say, I am Mitch Mash, and don't anybody else try and sneak in there and do that, uh, and give her your real name, and which I'm guessing is Mitch, um, and then she will send you this copy of the book, and that's great. And before wow. we say goodbye to John and wrap up this show, I want to let you know that we're going to be saying goodbye to Sophia, which breaks our hearts around here. Absolutely breaks our hearts. Um, Sophia is from Iceland, and she's been here on a visa for the last year. And before she can renew the visa and come back under certain work circumstances, she's got to go back to Iceland. So we are going to be Sophia-less, but we certainly hope that she comes back here. Um, we love her dearly. She's done an amazing job. Uh, she's in the office right next to mine, and we get along great, and the whole staff loves her. So she will be missed, and we hope she comes back. Um, she is a darling of a person, absolutely, and, and a Great worker, really cares about our members. She's very efficient. She's everything you'd want uh, in a staff member. And she is being replaced by a, a gentleman who just started this morning that she is training. And his name is Nick Fitzgerald. So I'd like to welcome Nick to the staff. Um, very nice, very smart guy. And we think he's going to do really, really well here. So we're glad to have him on board. And one more time, let's uh, talk about your event that you are doing Thursday uh, February 26th at Musicians Institute uh, at Mc on McCadden Place, if I remember correctly, yeah. like McCadden and Hollywood Boulevard, mm -hmm. uh, 7 p.m., and it is called the Music Mega Panel, Ab Music for Advertising, mm -hmm. uh, with four or five big uh, advertising music executives on there. It's 35 bucks. Is there a code that you can give them on the show? Uh, uh, the if you, uh, yeah, if you, uh, PMA Friends is a discount code. It gets you $15 off, so it's 20 bucks. Okay. PMA Friends, all one word. Go to musicmegapanel.com to order, and uh, all the panelist bios are there. All the information is there, all the details. You need to come to this panel. I counted up the music budgets for all five of my panelists, and it comes out to over a quarter billion dollars a year. Wow. All the tours they sponsor, all the spots they soup, all the custom commissions, all the performance royalties for the writers and for the publishers, and all the SAG royalties comes out to over a quarter billion dollars. So I don't know like what what else to do for people to to make a full time income with their music. But now these people all on one stage, they're all nice, cool people. They're great. They love music, and uh, we'd we'd love to see you come out and uh, and be a part of it. Oh, also this this person made you you made, made the look. look. Mentioned Sherry's berries. And I, I heard about Sherry's Berries from the Bill Burt podcast. And I don't know why that matters. It's just really funny because I haven't heard about it other really? than from Bill Burr. Yeah. Uh, Sherry's you, Berries. Do yeah. you not have a TV set at home? First of all, Sherry's Berries, after the road rally, um, members always uh, send us anything from, uh, oh gosh, uh, anything from little taxi models to cookies to brownies to thank you notes. Uh, and one of the things that we got this year, um, I think from the Baums, B-A-U-M, if I remember correctly, if mm -hmm. they're watching the show, thank you very much. Uh, and they sent us Sherry's Berries, and they are damn good chocolate-covered berries. Sherry's Berries. Yeah. So there you go. Um, what's, a good, <laughs> what's a good community to raise kids in that's close to L.A. and Sino? Yes. Uh, there are a bunch of them. Um, just not Hollywood. You MusicMegapanel.com has all that info on schools. Music Mega Panel. All so right. There you go. So that's it. Um, John, great to see you as always. I will see you. Uh, I'll be there Thursday, the, the 26th. And uh, yeah, we actually hang out sometimes. So yeah. It's always great to have you here. For Thank sure. You so You're much for, for having uh, me. It's great. Always a pleasure. And we will see you guys next week. 
I kind of remember that I had a guest scheduled for next week and didn't write it in my book. If I'm hallucinating that, then next week we're going to do a broadcast quality show. Let's get you back in the shot. Um, do a show about broadcast quality because we haven't done one of those in a while. Until then, thank you very much for joining us. See you next week for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live. Baby. Woo! Do I have to do woo? Woo woo! Somebody actually told me I had to once. So there you go. Bye, you guys. <laughs>